Okay, so um, welcome everyone to today's uh, Sunshine State Digital Network webinar uh, called Toward Principles of Anti-Oppressive Community Engagement. Our presenters today are gonna be Jordana McCagney and Molly Brown from Northeastern University. And um, I would first start like to start by acknowledging our funders for uh, today's session. So today's session is funded uh, through the Library Services and Technology Act provided by the Institution of Museum and Library Services, uh, administered through the Florida Department of State Division and uh, Division of Library and Information Services. So we'd like to thank them for their funding of today's session. And uh, just a few housekeeping items. Today's session is being recorded. So your uh, name or image may appear in that recording, uh, just so you're aware of that. And um, uh, we have enabled uh, closed captioning for this session. It is a live automated transcript. So please excuse any errors that you may see there. Uh, you can turn that on by clicking the live transcript button at the bottom of your Zoom window. That is also where you can turn that off if you do not wish to see captions on your screen. And uh, without further ado, I will go ahead and pass uh, the baton over to our presenters today. Great. Well, welcome, everyone. I am going to take over the screen share. Um, and so just really briefly, I want to give an outline for our time together today. Um, we'll begin with kind of an orienting um, presentation from myself and Jordana, um, kind of sharing and framing these principles for community engagement and collaboration. Um, then we will kind of break out into group discussion and imagine together we'll take some time to personally reflect and think through who our stakeholders and collaborators are. And then we'll take some time for discussion um, about specific principles and then we'll share as a group. Um, this discussion is pretty flexible and especially given the size of the group today, I think that we can be really flexible. So I'm happy to kind of collaborate and imagine together um, as, as co-educators. All right. So um, since I'm presently talking, Jordana, I will introduce myself and then pass it over to you. Um, so I am Molly Brown. I'm the reference and outreach archivist at Northeastern University. My pronouns are she, her. Um, and I'm talking to you from Pawtucket, Wampanoag, and Massachusetts land. Um, and I'm excited to be joining Jordana, the, the kind of primary thinker and leader on this, um, to discuss toward principles of anti-oppressive community engagement. And it's over to you. I am Jordana McConney, and I am head of special collections and university archivist at Northeastern University right down the street from Mali. So um, next slide. I'd like to start with a quote um, from Bell Hooks from her book, Marginality as a Site of Resistance. There is no need to hear your voice when I can talk about you better than you can speak about yourself. No need to hear your voice. Only tell me about your pain. I want to know your story. And then I will tell it back to you in a new way. Tell it back to you in such a way that's become mine, my own. Rewriting you, I write myself anew. I am still author, authority. I'm still the colonizer, the speaking subject, and you are now at the center of my talk. So as I mentioned, I'm head of special collections and university archivist at Northeastern. And we collect, house, and carefully curate a diverse and growing collection of historical records relating to Boston's fight for social justice. We make available the history of Boston's social movements, including civil and political rights, immigrant rights, and urban and environmental justice, as well as Boston's public infrastructure, neighborhoods, and natural environments. We give special attention to the history of Boston's African-American, Chinese, LGBTQA, and Latinx communities. I should mention here that I'm part of none of these communities, but I do spend a lot of time listening, appreciating, and amplifying Boston's marginalized voices. I spend time working on citywide race and resilience efforts. And along the way, I've developed a trust network of folks in these communities who I can go to for advice, but who will also not shy away from telling me when I'm out of line. Because of what I do, faculty regularly reach out to me to ask me about a project that they want to do in these communities. 
And sometimes I'm happy to do this. I only have to reach out to somebody in my trust network, make sure that they're amenable and make an introduction. But sometimes faculty come to me with, with a project that a gut check would tell me is wildly inappropriate. Over time, I realized that my gut was telling me that the projects that they were proposing were just not community informed. They would take information or resources from the community without giving anything back. So the rule of thumb became nothing without us, nothing about us without us, communities would tell me, community members would tell me. <clears throat> I went looking for a tool, an article, or a set of best practices that I could point faculty toward that would explain why these projects were problematic to give me a cover for saying, no, I'm not gonna introduce you to, to this person in my network. I wanted a how-to guide for good community engagement. I went to the library literature and didn't really find anything. The archival literature from the 80s and 90s had great documentation strategy literature. And recently the scholarship on radical empathy has been incredibly inspiring. Next slide. Oh, here it is. Yeah. Including this quote, in their criticism of neoliberalisms tending to favor free market capitalism, and asking for a feminist ethics of caring in the archives, Ricky Punzelon and Michelle Caswell encourage archivists to responsibly and productively demonstrate how certain archival actions contribute to or sometimes impede social equity and inclusion. After digesting the values of radical empathy and analyzing our practices, my department spent time trying to remove barriers to our collections in order to become as community focused as possible. For example, we took away fees completely. Our scan on demand policy says within reason, but reasonable to us is actually very flexible. And we've become the go-to place for our community partners anniversary. So, you know, whenever somebody has is doing some fundraising around their 150th or 30th anniversary, we're right there um, in partners in their history making. but I still hadn't found a how-to. So I attempted to create my own. Uh, early trial balloons include, included a fake certification programs for a digital humanities project that follow a set of guidelines or principles that I call LEAD, Leadership and Engaged and Digital Ethical Digital Humanities Projects in 2017. I presented to at DLF in 2018 and talked about how I went looking for an ethical community engagement for dummies resource and couldn't find one. So I made a mini zine with some ideas, which is how I met Keila. I then wrote an article about how paywalls are bad for underrepresented communities, which talks a lot about ethical community engagement. Meanwhile, at Northeastern, I talked with campus collaborators about community engagement and many of them said, oh, everybody writes about this stuff. A Cherokee language scholar pointed me to a huge bulk of indigenous studies literature about ethical stewardship. Another pointed me to participat participatory design research, a field of research that uses ethical, a set of ethical principles as a guide. My black feminist studies colleagues gave me some amazing resources. I found out that Rebecca Riccio, who is the director of the Social Impact Lab at Northeastern, had already convened a group of Northeastern faculty and staff in 2016 to examine the case for adopting campus-wide standards for ethical community engagement, ethical community engaged teaching and research, and had drafted a white paper, which I found incredibly interesting. I also found Becca Berkey, who at the time led the service learning program at Northeastern, had worked hard to create ex expectations for faculty and staff doing projects in Boston's various communities to use anti-racist practices. We began convening an ad hoc group to share best practices, discipline specific applications, and our own commitment to experiences as educators and practitioners who share a commitment to racial and social justice. The group also functioned as a kind of support group to share stories of problematic activity, workshop how to deal with challenging situations or colleagues, and to hold each other up when necessary. 
I learned that trying to shift power at a university to make room for true effective diversity, equity, and inclusion work often results in a lot of personal and professional blowback. In the aftermath of George Floyd's, Floyd's murder, murder in 2020, the three of us began articulating these principles and practices more concretely as a commitment to holding ourselves accountable. We felt that because our roles at the university have called for deep community engagement and interdisciplinary collaboration on and off campus, we were uniquely positioned to pull together the wisdom gifted to us by our collaborators with diverse identities, roles, and experiences. So I know that you all are gathering with us as fellow archival practitioners, people looking at um, community and history and storytelling. And the story that Jordana provides us with are kind of the first steps for, for seeing the whole of it, right? Seeing the whole of the institution, the problems, um, the networks and the opportunities. Another part of that universe is our universe of the space that we do have control over, um, that we do have an opportunity to create direct and um, swift impact, um, as Jordana alluded to earlier. So the question that we continue to ask ourselves and continue to reflect on is how do you navigate the limits your institution off with the limits of your institution with offers? These offers can be resources, they can be events, it can be time. And how do those offers provide opportunities to develop trust, joy, care, and deeper relationships with those that consent to deeper relationships? And how do you have transparent conversations and make a space safe space to have them? And I think many of us would hope that someone in our reading room that found something offensive, surprising, or needed support about something could come up to the desk and talk to us. But those steps to come up to the desk require a lot of trust, understanding, and um, decreasing power, right? You're seeking that sort of horizontal relationship in a room that has been historically built up to be quite hierarchical. Um, so, so how do you remove the power or how do you democratize it? And so the hardest part that you can take care of yourself is how we welcome people in, what we can offer, um, and even if our institution makes choices that are detrimental to our work. Um, so, you know, with Northeastern specifically, what we navigate is that it is in the center of many neighborhoods, um, many neighborhoods that are primarily peopled by Black communities in Boston and communities of color. And Northeastern has had a directly antagonistic at times relationship to those communities through its development without um, community collaboration, without community input, or without hearing and putting into action the community input that they solicited. Um, and, and that's a pretty long history. So how do we navigate that history that continues to occur and will continue to occur without Jordana or I being able to completely intervene, although we can certainly try? What can we offer here in the archives? And how can we make this a safe space, even though it is part of a larger space that has largely made people feel unsafe? And so for me, I am the person, reference and outreach archivist, that is in charge of the reading room. So I'm really hoping to, you know, provide a space where our communication styles and the type of communication that we offer is in direct um, opposition to the type of communication you might see an institution such as a university that has been gentrifying a neighborhood does. We try to always have ease and comfort and no deadlines um, and no um, kind of terseness in our emails. We try to be warm, we try to be kind. And those are the, the training sentiments that all of the folks that manage our reference are taught with. Um, we charge no fees for scans. Um, we try to be flexible with appointments in the reading room. We try to page materials as soon as possible. A lot of these resources that we try to provide are very people heavy in terms of what they require of the archive. But when you are charged with telling the story, preserving the records that are representing the communities and neighborhoods around you, it's your job to make sure that it is as easy and joyful um, and accessible as possible. So thinking about, you know, as we keep discussing this, your reading rooms, your reference email, your policies, how are they generously worded? And how are they worded in ways that are in direct collaboration and hearing how communities might best like to learn from you and with you. 
Um, and Jordana has another side of this that she has to address. Um, we continue to have collections from community members that come in. Um, so she has her own way of navigating that as well. So when I, you know, when I first started at Northeastern, I realized that a lot of the communities, even communities that we'd already worked worked with and organizations we'd already worked with, um, changed staff, and we needed to continuously educate folks about what the archival process looks like. How does acquisitions happen? And and so you know what I did was I created a, a inf information guide for collection donors outlining this is how we do things. We go and meet. We have a gift agreement. We make sure that you're all comfortable with things. Um, and then physically how the collection gets moved and then what happens to it afterwards and being pretty honest about backlogs, <laughs> even though you don't actually say the word backlog, but you know things like it will take some time for us to continue to finish up a finding aid for you. Um, and then just generally trying to be, I, I think, um, Archivists have sometimes have a, a sort of collections archivists have sometimes a a little bit of um, an a, a, an attitude, especially collecting archivists have an attitude about well you should know about these things, and and also you know I want your materials versus explaining what the larger field looks like. So one of the things that I try very carefully to do is to not shark <laughs> and explain that, you know, we aren't the only game in town. There are lots of other organizations, lots of arch archival organizations around that might be a better fit for you and, and with you and your collection. So, you know, talking about the field and giving advice and then also offering to be, um, offering to give advice to, you know, folks and organizations who are considering other repositories for their collections. So I think, you know, so trying to be honest um, with these folks in general has been very, very helpful and also increases this kind of trust. Yeah, and before I go to the next slide, Jordana, I'll also note that, you know, we're happy to talk more specifically and concrete about various practices. Um, this is kind of just a general introduction to our ethos. And when we break out, you know, we can talk about this more, but this is just to kind of inspire you to think about the various parts of our work that really impact this community engagement work. So after Rebecca and Becca and I started working together, we ended up publishing a white paper in our digital repository um, called Principles of Anti-Oppressive Community Engagement. And the intent is to mitigate the harms that can result from community-engaged teaching and research, including the, the, the work we do in the archives, and support the development of systems of, of accountability between campus and community stakeholders. <clears throat> And if you want to just take your phone out and scan this QR code, it should bring you directly to the principles. So right now, Molly and I will just go over the principles as they exist. Um, and as, as we've written them out, um, we've also um, agreed to view these set of principles as a working document and nothing set in stone. It's important for us to continue to reframe um, these ideas and and the the and gather information from community members and and organizations and individuals so that we continue to work on developing our own internal North Star when it comes to these things. But number one. Um, honor community's autonomy and right to self-determination. So we'll acknowledge when we are visitors in other people's communities, let them define the challenges and opportunities that they face and define success on their own terms. All right, principle number two. Respect communities' history, culture, lived experience, and expertise. We will enter communities as listeners and learn as much as possible about the history, culture, and lived experiences and assets of the communities we engage with and honor the legitimacy and value of diverse forms of knowledge and expertise without placing the burden of teaching us on community members. Well, 
will acknowledge that we're, so number three is recognize the limits of our lived experience, expertise, and perspectives. So we will acknowledge that we're not the first or only people to problem solve in the communities we engage with. And we need to question the frameworks, narratives, and assumptions that have shaped our understanding of the world and the disciplines and fields in which we work. Reflect on our social identities, positions, and power for number four. We will cultivate self-awareness and do the work of grappling with our own social identities, biases, and motivations for doing community-engaged work, and elements of discomfort we may feel working in and with communities not our own. Recognize the power and privilege associated with our positions in higher education and question whether our engagement in community settings is welcome and adds value. Number five is to build authentically, authentic, mutually beneficial relationships with patients and humility. So we'll center community members' voices and perspectives and recognize our collaborations as co-educators. We will practice co-design, co-creation, and co-ownership of ideas, data, publications, credit, and profit, if there is any. Manage resources equitably for number six. We will recognize that control of resources is a form of power that can perpetuate inequity in our relationships with community partners. We will ensure that our collaborators are recognized and appropriately compensated for their physical, emotional, and intellectual labor and other contributions to our work and be cognizant of limited resources available to many community-based organizations and consider how to best deploy the resources available to us as equitably and effectively as possible. Number seven is hold ourselves accountable. We will hold ourselves accountable for the impact of our words and actions and work internally to promote values and practices that center community interests and well-being. Number eight, rethink our relationship with time and urgency. We will acknowledge that the pace of building trust and relationships cannot be hastened by the academic calendar, grant deadlines, funding opportunities, and other sources of urgency, and cultivate patience and value the work of building and stewarding each relationship, which may involve the efforts of many individuals on and off campus. Number nine, hold ourselves accountable to the values and practices of anti-oppressive community engagement in our relationships with students in our classrooms. We will respect the diverse identities and lived experience of our students and give deference to students' experience of racial and social injustice and relationships within issues and communities we're addressing. And as educators and folks who work with students, we don't know what kind of experiences students bring to the table. For example, Northeastern has a large international population and their ideas of what injustice looks like is often wildly different from their American counterparts. So 10, prioritize patience, perspective taking and joy. This work can be emotionally challenging for us, but we need to be cognizant that it may weigh far more heavily on the people and organizations on the front line of this work. Embrace vulnerability and gracious listening to feedback, but most importantly, find hope, joy, and meaning in the work. Um, and I, I love the embrace vulnerability and gracious listening to feedback as fundamental elements of this work, knowing we will make mistakes and accept them as lessons we can build on to improve relationships in our collaborative work. Okay. So we have reached the point where we have shared and said aloud all of the principles that Jordana, Becca, and Rebecca collaboratively built together. Um, at this time, I'm going to briefly stop sharing our screen um, because now has arrived the time for us to discuss and imagine um, and, and build futures of better collaborations um, and community engaged work together. All right. So now for, you know, putting Jordana's principles and um, all of the principles shared by Becca Berkey and Rebecca Riccio um, into practice, we have prepared a Google Drive that offers a space for reflection and discussion. Um, all of these prompts and work can be done individually, but we encourage you to maybe, you know, grab a, a trusted partner or colleague um, to do this sort of reflective work out loud. 
Um, so first, I will kind of walk us through the drive and the various documents that are in there, because there are some documents that exist there in multiple formats. Um, and then we'll, we'll give some kind of prompts and, and opportunities for, for how to work with them. So first um, in this drive is a link to our slides, which also includes the script and speaker notes. If you wanted to know what was said with the slides, um, you can view that here. It's a shortcut to them. They appear here. But if you really want to begin doing this reflective work, there are two worksheets in this drive that are available to you. One is a more truncated worksheet that doesn't address each principle, but addresses a selection um, for you to just begin prompting that work both within yourself, but also within your community and collaboration. So first we'll go to that. Um, it'll say group one um, because we did it as a group of one um, during the, the live recording. Um, if you would like to go through the entire worksheet, um, there is a PDF in the drive, full manifesting ethical principles worksheet. This will walk you through every principle and reflective prompts for each principle, but we'll take a look at both. So if you go to group one, um, Sunshine Digital Network Manifesting Ethical Principles um, Truncated Reflection Sheet, um, you can begin with part one. In part one, you will be asked to reflect on the stakeholders you presently have, perhaps the stakeholders and community collaborators you would like to have or that could be occurring at some point in the future, thinking about who they are or who they might be, um, where that collaboration geographically impacts, um, what social communities that will be impacted through this partnership and collaboration, and who the key stakeholders are. That may be the folks involved in the collaboration, those that are represented within the collaboration, um, and, and beyond. After you've reflected on kind of the stakeholder communities that you are currently working with or aspiring to work with, we ask you to take a look at some of the principles with some more um, specific questions to put yourself into a commitment to action or into establishing a very clear action to move forward. So the first um, principle is to recognize that the limits of our lived experience, expertise, and perspectives. This gives you an opportunity to think about what your lived experience means to you, what steps you will take to learn about other lived experiences and address issues of those lived experiences. Um, consider the frameworks and assumptions that are embedded into your own lived experiences and the toolkit to understand those that you have established and how you will bring a critical lens to understanding them. So this is in particular addressing principle three, which is a very, you know, personal principle. After that, you take a step and imagine um, with principle five, build authentic, mutually beneficial relationships with patience and humility. Again, you are asked more direct critical questions in which you can develop an action or a commitment to action, thinking about what an authentic and mutually beneficial relationship means to you, how you are going to center community voices in that relationship, how comfort and safety is established, how co-ownership, co-designing and co-creation is established, how communication and feedback will take place equitably and consistently, and how you will create norms um, to ensure an open, transparent, and respectful relationship. Um, so this is something to reflect upon and improve upon. All of these prompts are ones that will continue to be done. Once you have reflected on it, you will continue to reflect and enact and change and adjust your action. But these are starting points here. In the drive, you can view the full version of that sheet and take it um, and do that same reflective work with each principle. Um, this is a PDF. You're welcome to download, print it out, change it into a format that works for you. Um, there is a Word doc and PDF version of the Group 1 um, truncated worksheet that's available to you as well. And while in our slides, the link to the white paper that discusses the principles and their developments is linked in there, um, we also have a, a simplified principles that's available to you in a Word doc, Google doc format. Um, so you're welcome to just kind of pull this up and see the principles in, in a more um, simple documentary form, um, maybe print it out and keep it at your desk. Are there any other practices for reflections um, that you want us to include, Jordana? Um, I know that we just went through that very broadly. Um, <laughs> so I'll, I'll leave oh, it to you to close it out. Okay, great. Yeah. Um, and, you know, feel free to contact Jordana and myself um, for, for collaboration, for support, um, or to 
develop any ideas that you have further out. Um, we may not be able to launch those ideas, but we will be able to hear you um, and, and provide support and solidarity. And with that, I will stop sharing my screen.